What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., and Claudia Bellafato here at the DraftKings Studio in Boston. We got a great show for everybody, as always. Make sure you download, subscribe, rate, and review it. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern and noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio. Fun one coming up today. Claudia, what do we got on the docket? Well, the playoffs technically start because we have the play-in tonight, which we will get to. Other team hoops, though, Team USA which Dame Lillard is not on the list of. We'll get to that list and talk about the fact that he may be unhappy in Milwaukee in just year one. Then Brown on the block. Could Eagles spending cost them a star receiver and take the money and run? Is Rory ready to bolt for Liv? Say what? But first, it's a Wilder Tuesday. You know, I'm Charlotte I'm is so overwhelmed happy. with emotion <laughs> yes. right now in the chat. I was like, do I start talking over this beautiful <laughs> Wilder Wednesday on a Tuesday music? That is that has that been there for have we had that for a while? You know what? I think the music is new, the graphic is a holdover, and so all of those powers combined. We are now Wilder Wednesday on a Tuesday, Claudia. I think, though, Charlotte, what we all have to do, because I just did it. I don't know about you guys, but we all got to dance a little. That way we can let it breathe, and then we come in. It's a good way to start the show, in my opinion. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that. Everybody, this is breaking the fourth wall. This is the <laughs> this is the good stuff. Uh, so thrilled to be <laughs> here with you. I love, start, love starting off my day with you guys. Yeah, we love a dose of Charlotte Wilder in the first hour, as always, but... Listen, if you're unfamiliar around here, you can catch Charlotte Wilder as a part of Oddball, great podcast and show here on the DraftKings Network with Amin L. Hassan every day but Monday. And Charlotte, this is your guys' time to shine. You are the basketball podcast here at DraftKings, and we are getting started with the NBA postseason. And I know Claudia kind of said it there. It feels the same way as the play-in games in March Madness where we're supposed to call it the first round, but no one really calls it the first round, and it feels very much like its own thing. But in general, Charlotte... I do feel like it's hard to look at what we're getting started with the play-in as anything other than an overwhelming success for Adam Silver now, multiple year sample size and the way that it's worked out. We'll get to Draymond Green's thoughts on this because I think it's an interesting admission from an active NBA player, but I think from our perspective, Charlotte, there's no doubt this has been an overwhelming success. Oh, yeah. I think this is one of the smartest things that NBA has done in a long time. I feel like this and the uh, in-season tournament um, are different sides of the same coin, and that coin is good and probably making the NBA money. Um, because I th- I think that there's something uh, truly thrilling about a win or go home situation. Obviously, with the play in that nine ten team, whoever wins that goes on to play another game. So it's not necessarily. I mean, sorry, the the eight seven team goes on to play another game. So does the nine ten. Um, but there is this element of like. You know, if these guys don't if these guys don't do it right now, then their season is over. And that's what we love about March Madness. That's what people loved about the in-season tournament uh, in those later rounds in Vegas. And I just think it makes the season that much more compelling because instead of, you know, it's like, well, these eight teams are locked in the West. These eight teams are locked in the East. Everybody else is going to just sort of stop trying. It's like oh my God, there is real drama at the end of the season about like, I was glued to the TV being like, what are the seeds going to be? Who's going to be where? Who needs to play for, who needs to play these last two games for for their lives? Because this is it. And then we saw last year, the Heat made it to the finals after losing a play-in game and then almost losing another one. So I don't think there's any way you can say that this is anything other than a success in terms of the the drama and storylines that, that, that it develops, Gojo. Yeah, I think you're right. Early on, you got the wins if you're Adam Silver in terms of the publicity because teams like Golden State and the Los Angeles Lakers have found themselves into this position before. But also, I think very important you had someone make it out of the mud. Like, you needed someone to kind of make a run out of that because if it just wound up being the same teams that got sawed off in the first round after all of this, then the ratings grab becomes a little bit more transparent, but now you can actually sell it from a competitive standpoint as well, which I think is key to anything you're going to try and do tweaking the postseason model, especially as we look at it this year and go... All right, on the West, this kind of works. On the East, we probably could have done without seeing a couple more games of Atlanta or Chicago, but, you know, sometimes the ball's not going to bounce your way. I don't know, though, Mike. We've got Heat 
Heat Sixers. And I don't think there's anything more terrifying in a play-in tournament than the Heat or the Sixers with Embiid finally. I mean, you know, he's probably not 100%, but they went on an 8-0 win streak to end the season. Um, And you've got Miami, who people forget. This is exactly how we talked about Miami last year. We were like, they're terrible. They are very, very bad on offense. They cannot yes. score. Like, I don't think it was very different. Because right now, because I'm sitting here, I'm like, well, but surely it didn't feel this bad. But, like, I think it felt this bad. So the fact that you have these two teams, and then, honestly, Heat, uh, uh, sorry, Bulls, Hawks, yes, I agree with you. People forget also the Boston Celtics could not win two games against them very recently. Who, Joe Mazzulla says they weren't trying. Who's to say? But I just think that I think that there's sneaky drama here in the East, Mike. I, I as Claudia is wearing heat red today, Claudia. I think Charlotte's <laughs> right though. Like we are very quick to forget that it feels like every heat postseason run post big three has felt like, oh, this roster, no, there's no way they could possibly compete. Surely Jimmy Butler alone is not enough. Now, <laughs> that's not to discredit Bam Adebayo, who's incredible and incredibly well-respected, and a lot of the other guys here, but we've never looked at this Heat roster and said, yes, this absolutely belongs in the games they end up playing in by the end of the season. It's Jimmy Butler, guys. Trust me. Like, I, I know when it gets to the full season, everybody is fading them. It's so, so easy to cherry pick against this team. All of the stats when you compare them to whatever roster they're playing because you say, oh, well, it really is just Jimmy Butler. But I think in a sense that sort of takes the weight off of their shoulders because they're saying we don't really have anything to prove. The Nuggets are trying to run it back. The Celtics are trying to prove a point. Sixers even are saying, hey, if Embiid's healthy, you know, we can run through a wall any with anybody. Where the Heat, they're like, all right, nobody believes in us, so let's just go out and make something happen. So I think, you know, personally, I don't discredit the Heat. I think that's going to be a great game. Um, but the West probably is a bit more exciting when it gets to the plans, which I do want to run through the two tonight. We have Lakers-Pelicans at 730 and then Warriors-Kings at 10. Lakers-Pelicans first, though, because, Charlotte, you said it. This has been so exciting up until the final day of the regular season because we saw these two with the rematch. And Pelicans could have avoided having to rematch them, but they didn't because the Lakers won again. So now up 3-1 on them. And now we have this interesting conversation of, well, you know, should the Lakers throw the game so they don't have to face the Nuggets? And is that something LeBron James would actually do? I don't know. This game's a pick 'em, a round of pick 'em. Pelicans favored by one. Charlotte, is that speculation? That could turn out to be true. Would the Lakers throw this game so they don't have to face the Joker in the next round? I, I do not think so. I think any time people talk about either throwing a game like this or tanking, I, players do not have that same mentality. Because if you're in the NBA, if you're in the NBA, you have to believe you can win any game that you're put into. Because otherwise, why are you there? And if you're if you're LeBron James saying, yeah, look, the the Nuggets, that would be scary. You know who else is scary? Basically every other team in the playoffs. And if you're LeBron James, you're like, I've been doing this for 21 years now. I know exactly what I'm doing. His team rallies around him. I just I just think that narrative is is I, I think it's a fun thing to think about. I just don't think players who are this great at what they do and this competitive really like what how do you go you go out there and you just miss shots at gojo you're laughing i just i feel like it's far-fetched well i'm laughing because charlotte you're doing this in a very like kind and diplomatic way and i'm about to throw to the sound from draymond green where he's going to be very oh, no. mean about this when he was <laughs> asked about the notion of trying to lose to avoid denver so there's a lot of talk around do you bomb that game and try to stay away from denver let me tell you you don't bomb a game to get in the playoffs and leave yourself with one game to get in. So any loser who came up with the idea, you're crazy. That makes no sense. Uh, you don't leave yourself in a game where the Pelicans could shoot the lights out and send you home, although you could do a lot to win that game. Uh, but they could shoot the lights out. Like, we've seen it happen. <laughs> Lakers have lost so, and, eight in and, a row, by the way, to the Nuggets. So it wouldn't be a good matchup for them, but I agree. It would be ridiculous for LeBron James, of all well, people, to listen, throw it. To Charlotte's point, too, and I think with the Lakers, with the Nuggets, 
You can make the argument, hey, you'd rather take them now while you're hot. Like, mm-hmm. get them at the beginning while you're not worn down by a couple of playoff series. By the time they got to the Western Conference Finals last year, there just wasn't a lot of gas left in the tank for a Lakers team that, hey, has to rely on shooting, getting kind of streaky, and needs Anthony Davis to do the every other night explode thing. And so... I think for them, you could make the you know spin zone argument. I think ultimately we're shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic, and whoever gets yeah. fed to the Denver Nuggets buzzsaw is just going to get fed to the Denver Nuggets buzzsaw because they're a better basketball team. But if you're going to try and suppose ways through this Charlotte, then I would say, yeah, I'd rather get them early than late, especially if I'm a team like the Lakers, because then if you're LeBron James, you can go back home and get some time in the offseason and recover your very old body. Yeah, I mean, I also think that what we saw with Anthony Davis in that last game where he tweaked his back. He says it's nothing serious. Mm -hmm. I do think that that highlights, um, I don't, I'm about to be mean like Draymond, how fragile this team can be uh, and how if you don't have Anthony Davis and you really don't have that size, that is basically the thing that the Lakers have when they're good. Um, So I think that facing I don't I think it's it's what you said, Mike. It doesn't matter. I also think that here are two teams with deep playoff experience. Uh the Nuggets won last year. The Lakers have LeBron James. They have people who've who've done this before. And um I think when it gets interesting is when you talk about the younger teams uh in the playoffs, like you know, the Thunder and the Timberwolves, it's like, well, what what are they gonna be able to do against experienced teams? I know that Timberwolves have some experience, but like they don't really have experience, yeah. um, you, you know, for, for all intents and purposes. Uh, so I, I don't think it makes much of a difference. And I think that a lot of this is going to come down to how do they show up that night? Because we've seen very erratic versions um, of this Lakers team. I don't think it looks particularly great uh, for them. But, you know, I'm never going to count out LeBron Although I I don't know it feels like the days of him completely putting a team on his back might not be uh, where we're at. But again, who's you know this is why we love sports people. I want to get a final answer from the both of you because like I said, it's a pick 'em right now at the DraftKings Sportsbook. So if you had to choose, it sounds like we all are in agreement. The Lakers aren't going to throw the game. Would you take the Lakers with their record three and one against the Pelicans this season to win this game? Go, Joe, you first. Uh, yes, I would. I-, I would actually pick the Lakers in this game. I think to Charlotte's point, we've got a better chance of LeBron James lightning in a bottle game early on now. Like I-, I think all of this to me is gamed on, hey, with an older team and LeBron James still at the center of this, he can get you one of these. The rest of it is if they're, if they're going to make a run is going to be, hey, how does Anthony Davis hold up physically? It is going to be, hey, do you get the good D'Angelo Russell that you've gotten during large stretches of this season where things have gone well for them? I think there are 15 and three in games where he scores 25 or more, or do you get the D'Angelo Russell that showed up later in the postseason last year that started to get worked out of the lineup uh, in the way that he did then? So uh, Charlotte, I think that's the long-term diagnosis, but in the short term, Term, I actually do think you can count on LeBron James to be enough in this setting. We're like, oh, by the way, on the other side, we got to see Zion in a postseason setting actually come out here and deliver for us since injury has kind of robbed us of so many opportunities to see him playing meaningful basketball. I don't know, guys. I feel like the Pelicans, they've been embarrassed by the Lakers a lot this year. Remember the in-season tournament where it was just an absolute blowout and, you know, Zion took a lot of heat for not being in shape. I think since then he's really worked on his conditioning. Uh, I think that this could be a bit of a wake up call. I know that they've not done well against the Lakers, including on last Sunday. Um, But I feel like there's a lot of incentive here for Zion and, and the, and the Pelicans to be like, wait a second, we are not this team that rolls over when it comes to LeBron. Like we are, we have something to prove here. And, you know, maybe, maybe they were just not, maybe they didn't turn, uh, turn the jets on last Sunday to surprise everybody. Not that they threw the game. We know people don't do that, but I, I think I, I'm going to go with the Pels, Mike. I'm going to keep things interesting here. I love it. 
All right, I like it. <laughs> Spicy. I also do think, and Charlotte, you mentioned it, for as much as we talked about Zion Williamson when we thought he was out of shape or playing a little bit too heavy, we have not had nearly the fanfare when this guy has now gone out here, leaned out, been playing point forward, helping lead this team in the back half of the season. There needs to be, especially if they win this game and start making a run, there needs to be some people coming out here patting Zion Williamson. Not that we need to necessarily pat every athlete on the back for essentially doing their job right. of showing up in great shape and performing incredibly well. But, you know, it feels like a lot of people went a little bit too far the other way with some of the weight comments there. And so it would be nice to see them rewarded on the other side with a little bit of praise. Yeah, I feel like this is also a great opportunity for Zion to get himself that praise by actually doing something. You know, I think if he does something, if he shows up sure, in this game... Sure then great. If he doesn't, then it's like, well, okay, you can be in shape or out of shape. You still can't beat LeBron. Mm. So what are we doing here, folks? Um, I think it'll be a fun game, though. I, I love these. I love these playing games. I, I feel like the playoffs, you know, we were joking on Oddball that the playoffs started last week, but they kind of have like things have things have mattered in a way that it's like if you if certain teams didn't win, then they went home. So I'm I'm psyched. I'm going to be there with my popcorn, guys. <laughs> yeah, Claudia, we've got the nightcap too. The Golden State Warriors are a fascinating force in all of this because if this was a month and a half ago, I would have said this was the team that scared me the most in the play-in because of their proficiency from beyond the arc, but it really seems like we're limping to the finish line with this group. Well, what's crazy is we just talked about the 7th and the 8th with the Pelicans-Lakers. They both get another chance, regardless or not, if they win that game. That's not the case with this Kings-Warriors situation, which is interesting. And we saw this matchup round one last year, went to game seven. Warriors, of course, sent the Kings home. So the Warriors are two and a half point favorites here, only laying two and a half. They've won 10 of their last 12 games, so they're getting hot at the right time, while the Kings have lost five of their last seven. So Charlotte. What do we think about this Warrior squad that we thought over the last two years would come in and dominate and they sort of, actually, no, they definitely did not. But like I said, getting hot at the right time. What's your take on this one? You know, this Warriors <laughs> team, guys, I would like to think that after the season they have had where they have basically looked into the void and the void stared back mm. and said, you guys are all getting older. I mean, they've all handled this in different ways. Like Steph has tried to sort of soldier through it. Draymond has had to go to counseling. Clay has been very frustrated. And then Steph has cried. Like, I think that you could hope that that would galvanize them. Um, I believe, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the Warriors are 0-2 in play-in games is the thing. They've beat the King. They beat the Kings last year. Uh, also, the Kings don't have Kevin Herter. Malik Monk is out with his knee. I don't yeah. know that this is the team that's going to show up the way that we would love them to, the way they showed up last year. Um, but I'm going to I'm gonna go with the Warriors because I would like to believe that after the season they've had, they have a little bit extra to prove, and maybe they'll be able to, to prove it against a team that's hurt. So if they can't, guys, I mean, also Kevin Hurt, Herter. <laughs> I was just going to say the the Sacramento Kevin Hurters is a pun too good for us to sit here and act like it's not good. So, uh, but you're right, Charlotte, that team, I mean, it's basically going to be like, can you get a DeMont Sabonis game where he just goes absolutely berserk and puts the team on his back in a matchup where, listen, you know, we know Draymond's obviously not the biggest guy inside. Trace Jackson Davis, who you've relied on in there a little bit more than Kevon Looney as of late, is going to be mm -hmm. in his first postseason action. So there's that to point back to for guys like him and Pajemski who have become important players for this team that you're right. It, it's, it has been the reckoning of the Golden State Warriors this year. And I think by all accounts, we've said this for a while, this feels like the final run for this iteration of the Warriors core based on everything we've seen these have felt like the death rattles before the big one and I do think they've still got enough in the tank to beat this Kings team but beyond that it seems like an outfit that spent most of the year fighting its own demise here that we're ultimately going to have to put down before it's all said and done so that gets started tonight we are are just getting started here today. And while we're getting set to talk plenty of NBA playoffs with Charlotte Wilder, coming up next, I'm going to talk a little bit of Olympics, getting the Avengers back together, why nothing motivates USA basketball quite like public embarrassment. <laughs>
Jojo and Golik with more Hoops Talk, this time Team USA, who is hoping to do a lot better this year than they did last year in the FIBA World Cup. And we do have the roster, 11 of its 12-man Olympic roster is set. And just look at those names. LeBron James, Steph Curry, KD, Embiid, Tatum, Booker, Holiday, AD, Anthony Edwards, Bam Adebayo, and Tyrese Halliburton. Team USA Managing Director Grant Hill keeping one roster slot open ahead of July training camp and exhibition games in Las Vegas. Like I said, they did not medal in the 2023 FIBA World Cup. So what did all of these players do? Picked up the phone, Gojo, and said, let's make some changes here. It, it, Charlotte, it is... I think the funniest modern international basketball phenomenon of like our lifetime all collectively, because growing up, we heard all about the dream team and all these Olympic squads that were so larger than life. Other countries are taking pictures while they're getting their asses whooped. And then somewhere along the line, the West of the world caught up enough to where we had to go through things like the redeem team after suffering, suffering public embarrassment, like we go through this cycle now with modern USA basketball where it's, hey, every once in a while we take our foot off the gas, we're reminded that other countries are good at basketball now, and then we have to get the entire band back together for really what feels like, Charlotte, one last heist considering the age of so many of the guys <laughs> in this roster. I know. It's like uh, Ocean's 15 at this point. Like, <laughs> I think it is funny, though, Gojo, how we for how, how the, the players seem to forget that, like, hey, when we don't send our best guys, we usually lose. And then it takes that to be like, oh, well, maybe we should try. Um, and I think it's that's pretty American, right? Like I think mm -hmm. it, I think it's a pretty American thing to be like, oh, no matter who we send, like we're gonna be fine. And then you're not fine, and you're like, oh, sorry, I guess that we forgot that. Uh, I'm. It's also interesting though, given like you know you had Kobe just destroying his own teammate in Pau Gasol in the Olympics. You had you, you had all of this intensity that it it reminds me of the conversation around the all-star game. Like, I don't want to have that conversation right now. Cause I'm so sick of that conversation, but I do think that there is this, um, reluctancy these days to risk any kind of injury or any kind of extra work on what could be a championship season in the NBA. Like, I think that is what it means the most to players. So these other things sort of have fallen by the wayside, but then when they're bad and embarrassing, I mean, obviously the same reaction was not had from players from the Ulster game, but you know, USA basketball is something where there is hardware. It is a huge stage. I mean, do you think with this lineup though, they can, they can win Gojo? Well, that's the funny part to think about is this lineup name value wise. It's like, Oh my God, this is incredible. I did have the wonder of like, all right, we got a bunch of 35-plus-year-olds that are the lion's share of this roster. They've got Halliburton and Anthony Edwards that are kind of there to be the bridge program till tomorrow. And I do wonder, because I know Anthony Edwards in the World Games and in the FIBA Games, that was kind of the light-going-on moment for a lot of people with him. I do wonder if this could be a real like star turn moment where we see Anthony Edwards start to morph into the best player in the world, quite literally, on this stage with the opportunity on this team. Because for everyone else, for LeBron James, like I didn't realize Steph Curry had never been on an Olympic team. Like, this is a first for Steph Curry and probably the last in all of this, but seeing that, yeah, Steph had played in World Cups before but not played in an Olympics was wild to me. Wait, what? Yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> That's crazy. Are you serious? I, I, I believe that was what I read. I believe I was right on that one where Steph Curry has not be, been on an Olympic team here. We know LeBron's been on a few. Kevin Durant's certainly been on a couple as well. And now get it. By the way, like just being able to get Joel Embiid over here too now to have him just decide, yeah, I'm going to be on the American team here. Incredible move by us. So, yeah, Charlotte, I think this is one of those that is kind of too big to fail in terms of the roster. Do you have any concerns? Well, yeah, because, I mean, I think when you look at, like, look at Canada. You know, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Jamal Murray, um, you know, other names that I'm blanking on because I don't think RJ Barrett is the threat. <laughs> other <that> Canadian we're... <laughs> players. Yeah, other Canadian guys. Um, you know, I just think that if they're not careful, if they're complacent, if there is any bit of like, oh, well, we have this crazy roster now. So of course we're gonna win, which is sort of the same thing as like we can send anybody and we're gonna win. I don't think it's gonna be 
a walk in the park. I mean, you have Nikola Jokic and, and a couple of like very hungry Serbs. That's scary. So I think, you know, maybe no one's going to be able to actually beat the U.S., but I think that we'll at the very least get some pretty fun games. Um, but I wouldn't hate. By the, I wouldn't by the hate way, I did double check this for you, it. Charlotte. This is Steph Curry's first Olympic Games. He has played for Team USA on two World Cup teams and won gold twice, Mm -hmm. but has yet to play in Olympics. And Joel Embiid has never played in an international competition. So they're led by 39-year-old LeBron, 36-year-old Steph Curry, 35-year-old Kevin Durant, who view this as kind of their last run at all of this. But yes, Steph Curry might go one and done in terms of the Olympics, and it seems like that guy is not going to let this end in anything but gold. Something we are not paying attention to here, people. Where are the Olympics this year? Paris? Paris. Hey. Who doesn't want to go to Paris? This feels <laughs> a little a little too suspicious that like, oh, when they're in wow. like, like, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, all these guys are like, you know what? Actually, I love the Olympics. I'm a patriot. I have loved America my whole life. I love basketball, and I'm going to bring home that gold. And it's like, that's interesting. Because I feel like there are a few restaurants saved on your Google Maps that you have been meaning to hit up for a while, gentlemen. They don't even care about America. Oh, man, especially- it's just about Paris and the croissants. <laughs> That's well, all. I mean, and all these guys are like, especially LeBron and them. Like, we see LeBron on the uh, mind the game now. Big wine guys go over there and drink a bunch of French wine. Go to a dinner with some nice pairings in there. Maybe check out the Louvre or something while you're over there. Charlotte, <laughs> you have opened my eyes to this. I know, I know, you guys are oddball, but this is very basketball Illuminati of you to remind people that oh no, they might just be cherry picking an incredibly well funded vacation that involves a little bit of basketball. They get to stay in shape on vacation. Maybe take home a little bit of gold you gotta i think you've got to declare that coming back into the u.s so yeah exactly customs also um if they don't win they can be like well we're old (laughs) exactly (laughs) yeah you're really proud of beating us we're old you feel good about yourself we are filled with escargot right now so you know (laughs) good luck to everybody I will say I'm a I, I'm a man who has tried to expand my palate as an adult. Some I don't know if I got that escargot dog in me. I really don't. Have Charlotte, you, you seem like someone who's had escargot. That's both a compliment and an insult. Thank you, Mike. Yes, I have. I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you said escargot. I was not just going to say, was it an incorrect <laughs> statement? Because I don't think it was. No, it wasn't. No, give me anything. I mean, I don't know. Are are snails? I think they're from the sea. Anything from the sea, you know. It, Aren't they? I don't know. Put this on the poll. Are snails from the sea? No. We need to find think, out because I genuinely Yeah, they are. They're sea are snails. They? I only see them on land. I No, I... Oh, you haven't seen snails in a tide pool? Do snails live in the sea? Sea snails are extremely diverse of marine gas rot. Yeah. Some of them are okay. in the sea. <laughs> Gastro. Okay. I, yeah. love how, Gast- I love how Claudia got no. to the word and was like, nope, we're not about to do this <laughs> on live TV. Skip over that one, not yeah. today, Satan. <laughs> no, they oh, can, sp- they can the spend time here. on land in salt water or fresh water. Herbivores, it is, carnivores, though, it omnivores. It is diverse. a common misconception that like escargot are very fancy. I think they sound fancy, but they are snails. They are snails. So I probably should have well, said uh, like, they're full of steak frites or or mm. caviar or something, which also isn't French. So, guys, someone save me from myself in this analogy. Well, steak frites is French. That's Charlotte, French. I will save you here because I have just received word from our official fancy correspondent and obviously longtime beloved member of the program, Jesse Cofield, who is still enjoying maternity leave right now. I don't want to Baja uh, blast this baby. escargot both fancy, buttery, and delicious. Mm. So uh, oh. we have just received word that if Jesse is a fan of it, then it absolutely qualifies as fancy charlotte so i'm sorry to break that to you i love it jesse my sister in in bougie in being just typecast is like oh you guys probably love this and we do and we do mike you put butter on anything though for you guys i mean i'm just saying see now we're talking about it. Foods that are just a vessel for butter. That's a conversation I am capable of having with you guys. But coming up next, I want to have a conversation about one of the names that we didn't hear on that list for Team USA Basketball and a name in the NBA that might be growing a little bit more discontent with their current situation. Why Dame Lillard found out the grass might not be greener and what happens next for one of the NBA's biggest stars.
All right, I want to get to this sound coming up of Damian Lillard or concerning Damian Lillard. Stephen A. Smith went on first take, and for all the talk about Stephen A. Smith as a talking head and and what first takes become, he is a guy whose background is in basketball. He's incredibly well-connected throughout the league, and so there are certain things I can believe, and especially with Dame Lillard, about him not being happy in Milwaukee because Dame has told us this because we knew going into this season he wanted to be in Miami, and we heard him naming his five players he'd like to play with all time, and none of them were his current teammates, including Giannis Antetokounmpo, and so the writing seems to have been on the wall, but I want to get to that, but first feel compelled to address what we just talked about in the break. So we were you know, devolving into escargot conversation, as one would on a show of such high class here, and mm-hmm. Claudia in the break decides to just casually weave into us that she's just recently tried hot sauce. Claudia, you really limped into this take here, trying to gauge if sriracha is even a hot sauce here. <laughs> Walk us through the journey, because I'm a little concerned for your taste buds. Yeah, I'm 27 years old, and I literally just tried it for the first time. And I hated it, and then I was like, let me try to mix some ketchup in with it. And now I still don't really like it, but I eat it, because it just kind of wakes me up in the morning gets me going so hot sauce don't really like it but i am eating it now morning okay uh (laughs) charlotte you look about as concerned as i am in this (laughs) well with my eggs people i'm not taking shots of hot sauce in the morning Yeah, no it's not weird to eat hot sauce with eggs it's the fact that you eat the way you phrased it was i've started eating hot sauce i think is this hot sauce sriracha so you know You know what, Charlotte? That part I actually agree with because sriracha kind of feels like a half measure. I don't know why. Maybe it's the delivery method with the little spout where I've got to shake so much just to get a little bit out there. Like, I'm sorry. There aren't a lot of other hot sauces that make me work that much for that little there. And you know what? I guess that's not totally true because you want to... Let's put it this way. I prefer the hot sauces with a nozzle that allow you to dump and not have to shake because when I want to go and include hot sauce in the equation... I'm looking for big boy servings. Everybody else can dial back. Like Mike Tomlin said, I'd rather say whoa than sick them. I want a hot sauce bottle that says whoa when I pour it out in terms of the volume coming. How about that? That's I want that on a shirt. <laughs> that could be what taken is, the wrong Charlotte, do you have a favorite hot sauce? Uh, you know, this is also probably a little bit too obvious. I love Frank's. I will put Frank's on. Absolutely. I would drink Frank's probably. I, you know, bad for your stomach, 100%. good for your heart. <laughs> I, Frank's is absolutely on the metal stand there. Cholula, my number one overall pick, though, would go with it every day and twice on Sunday. Louisiana hot sauce, also really sneaky. That's my current one in the pantry right now. An absolute banger. Delivery method a little closer to what Claudia is describing there, but oh. you know, we work through it. God gives his toughest battles to me, his strongest soldiers. He sure does. Also, chili crisp. Oh, my God. Have you? Mm. It's incredible. I have not had chili crisp. No, I've I've had Topatio, Texas Pete. I've had basically everything. So this is interesting to me. Chili crisp was like a chili oil with like toasted. It has like garlic and and sesame and all these spices in it. Oh, my God. And it's crunchy and it's spicy. That on eggs. Now my mouth is watering. Literally. (laughs) I was just going to say my was too. (laughs) I don't actually even know. I don't even remember buying this hot sauce, first of all, and I also don't think it has a label on it. So I'll have to get back to you, but this is good for my knowledge, yeah. There's a lot going on here, All right, this is really interesting. (laughs) Claudia does not actually know what she's ingesting at breakfast time. If it's hot sauce, if it's not, we'll report back on that as we get going here because now I'm starting to get worried for my friend. It's something about that chair that produces very strange experiences with foods in the DraftKings studio in Boston. In the meantime, let's play this sound from Stephen A. Smith on first take the other day talking about Damian Lillard in Milwaukee, who, again, has come over here, made noise finally in Portland after 11 years out of there. We heard all of the public, you know, everything coming out of his camp was Dame wants to be in Miami. And Portland said, ah, 
Actually, I don't think so, and jettisoned him to Milwaukee. We all thought, all right, great. Matched up with Giannis Antetokounmpo, who was banging the drum around there again for some help from that Milwaukee franchise before he was going to sign on, and it's just never quite materialized. There's been a coaching change in the midst of the season, and now they're going into a postseason where their best player in Giannis is nursing a calf injury for the last couple of weeks that we hope is better, but we can't be sure. So this is Stephen A. with that as background on the future of Damian Lillard and in Milwaukee. If Milwaukee loses, I said, I think you need to consider moving Dame up out of there. It's he not, just let, got there. Let me explain. I'm not talking about his game. He's not happy there. Now, he's got a lot of distractions, which are his business, mm-hmm. and we wish him nothing but the nothing best. But the best. Nothing but the right. best. Because a lot of us would not be able to handle it as well as he's handling it. And so, Charlotte, I can't speak to those distractions. Obviously, we heard from Dame himself that it's been difficult being away from his family, his entire life and his family and all the people close to him being out in Portland where he had built this life for himself from a human level can certainly understand that. Being alone really for the first time in your adult life then in a new place where you're also working through new teammates and the challenges that come with being on a contender now after years in Portland where they've sort of flirted with that idea but never gone all the way in, it is a different section of problems for Dame Lillard, but do you think it could truly result in something like a one and done for him in Milwaukee? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, I, I, I feel like he still probably wants to go to Miami. I honestly think that that would be a good fit for him. I think that the Milwaukee experiment has been pretty depressing. I mean, if you look at Dame, like I think Dame has always looked kind of sad when he's playing basketball. <laughs> given that what he was doing in Portland uh, or what he was dealing with. But I think that there's a little bit of a leg up in terms of cutting a sympathetic figure when it's like, oh, I've been so loyal to this franchise and they won't give me what what I need and I didn't want to join a super team. And it's like, well, buddy, you probably should have. You probably should have because it's very hard to feel bad for someone when it's like you didn't actually help yourself. Sure, you were trying to be like an quote, nice guy or a good teammate. But if that's what, if you wanted to win, that's what it takes these days. You have to, you have to, James Harden's gotten to a bunch of different good teams and he hasn't done it the nice way. So I just think there's an element of this where it's like, and I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do, but I'm saying it was effective. Now, Dame is on another team where he didn't want to be. I think that the coaching situation there was very bizarre. I think that there are a lot of different personalities. I feel like this really is Giannis's team in a way that I don't know how much room that leaves for anyone else. And I and I don't know that Dame is assertive in the way that you kind of have to be to to go toe to toe with that in your own locker room. So I'm not shocked at all. I'm not shocked at all. And and I think that there's just been sort of a a lackluster effort to to make it work together. And I don't know whose fault that is. I don't know. I don't I'm not in that locker room, but I think it's I, I think that aside from Dame telling us, aside from, you know, his family still being in Portland and all of that, I think just watching him play, it's pretty obvious that like, oh, this guy's not having the best time. I think I also think it is tough after being the center of attention for so long, and obviously that translated to actual play and statistics to now sort of being in the shadow of Giannis. That's tough. It's hard for me, though, to see a one-and-done happen when we haven't been able to see that transition. Like, there is still not a full transition. I get they've been together for a full season, but that's still a struggle for me to picture the fact that he would leave after that short amount of time. But also, I've never played in the NBA. I did play sports, and I know you uh, the environment that you're in has a massive impact. And as much talent as he has, it would be unfortunate to see him go through a second season if he doesn't like it. I have my ticket on the box, so I, think, I would love to see them win, but I don't think they're going <laughs> to. I, I think it's twofold, though, where it's one, this might be a bit of an indictment on the environment in Milwaukee overall, the fact that the vibes have been that bad there when you've had a chance to bring in a player like this to put alongside your superstar and Giannis, who every once in a while likes to remind the franchise, hey, I don't have to be here if you're not going to help me win. But on the other side, to Charlotte's point, I think it's a reminder that this path isn't for everyone. When we talk about what James Harden and Kevin Durant and these guys have done, it's not easy in all these ways that we just sort of take for granted when we look at these people as sports robots and Dame sort of showing us, hey, I resisted this for a long time for a reason and now that I'm Mm -hmm. sort of doing it because enough got to be too much, 
I'm reminded of why I was resistant to this to begin with. Maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I don't know, but I do think it's a reminder that this path of player empowerment that we've talked about has pitfalls that haven't always been discussed because this is different for every person. the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. In the least surprising news possibly of all time, yes, Caitlin Clark was number one overall off the board. And what a night it was, the WNBA draft held at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It marked the league's first draft with fans since 2016. Tickets sold out in under 30 minutes. So the fever got Caitlin Clark, the Sparks took off Cameron Brink from the board, the Sky took Camila Cardoso. And Senior's not here to defend himself because he's dealing with tech issues, but he was wrong. He trashed Angel Reese going number seven overall. As we talked about, the Sky clearly thought she'd be off the board, so they switched with the Lynx, and they scooped her up, the star from LSU. I have to say, just quickly get this in there, the fits were fitting, the girls looked good, but it's so awesome, Charlotte, to see the hard work pay off for these women. Oh my God. I mean, the, when they cry, I cry, you know, and, and I love that. I love that Caitlin and Holly Rowe interviewed her and she was like, you know, I did the, the, the sound, the music came on or it started, the draft started. And I was like, uh, she was like, I got a little nervous. And cause like, imagine everyone saying like, it's what you said, uh, Gojo, the, the fever had the opportunity to do the funniest thing. I'm glad they didn't. I also, you know what, respect to Caitlin, every chance she got, she said, tickets are selling out, buy your tickets. She was like, it's a hot ticket. And I just, I appreciate that she knows exactly what she's bringing to this franchise and to this league. Um, I also thought that it was pretty funny that she said, she was asked about her Mount Rushmore. Um, and, you know, she said, Maya Moore, a, a few other, and then she said, you know, I'm going to put uh, Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi on there as the last spot. 
which after Love that for the kid. Exactly, like after the the criticism that Diana and Sue said, and then everyone saying they were mean, even though like since when have players not been haters? Caitlin was like, shout out. I just, you know, she knows how to play the game, Gojo. I mean, listen, she's someone that's never shied away from a good bit of trash talking either. Now mm-hmm. it's just coming from people that are more vetted and ten- more vetted and tenured than her in this league. So, no, I, I thought all around it-, it hit the marks last night. It felt big, right? The entire draft sequence felt big. You mentioned having fans back in there, Claudia, and how quickly the tickets sold out. The Indiana Fever I saw s- basically sold out their arena for a watch party for this draft yeah. where you had tens of thousands of people in there in Indiana to go and watch the future of their franchise come join Aaliyah Boston and that was what Caitlin said she said I'm just gonna feed the ball down to Aaliyah Boston like you're right Charlotte her ability to meet the moment every step of the way in a time where and you've heard a lot of the older guard of the W talk about this even retired players saying we were constantly in sell mode for this league we were trying to get people like Caitlin did there to come out and watch it and so now to have something where the WNBA as their commissioner Kathy Engelbert put it went from hey we were in survive mode and now we're in thrive mode and now they're getting ready to grow there's talk of expansion there's talk of all these other ways to continue growing the product here now you're the shepherd of something and watching Caitlin Clark and these other people come in as young women the same way we talk about with athletes all over sports and seem to be capable of handling this because of how big of stars they were on the college level is a real testament to just how developed these people are coming in, not only as athletes, but as business people and as CEOs of these burgeoning companies. Totally. And and the fact that Caitlin was able to, I mean, all of them, like they were all, it, it was all very moving too. I mean, you had the, and the differences between them, you know, Cameron Brink, um, was so she's sort of been a pro since high school. Like she's trained with a pro trainer since high school. I think Camilla Cardozo really that got me choked up when she said, um, you know, she she left home, she left Brazil at 15, didn't speak English, came to the States, played basketball, you know, it is now on the sky with Angel Reese, which oh my God, that is going <laughs> to be. God, Good I was going to say the Minnesota Timberwolves School of Team Building. Just <laughs> seriously, seriously. But she said, you know, I came here to give my family a better life, and I was like, well, okay, you know, it, it puts it all in perspective what these what these people have to um, sacrifice to get where they are, and and part of that is learning how to to speak publicly and try not to say the wrong thing and and then say enough of the right thing while still being interesting i mean it's like an impossible tightrope to walk um and i just thought that the the moment did feel really big because of how the w put it on but also because of how these players met that moment um and and that that was fun that was really fun to see Claudia mentioned the outfits. I do think in general, watching draft fashion and the way it has changed over the years, because I always said it was so funny. Like, obviously, we go back to like the 03 NBA draft and the big box suits that have been made fun of in the commercial again with Perk and Mello. But it's my favorite time of year where you used to get to watch players go from, and I remember my old teammates, like, you're getting suits that they're the three-for-one deal at Joseph A. Bank, or you're going for the cheapest thing at Men's Warehouse, and we all looked terrible because we were cobbling it together on a college kid budget back in the day. And now because of NIL, like, I watched Kate, or I watched uh, Caleb Williams in a Gucci suit or something, except the Heisman two years ago. Caitlin Clark was the first athlete, men or women's, I believe, in basketball to be dressed by Prada for the the draft and all of these women have been balling out in these kind of outfits during the season because they got money now so the transition is a little bit more effortless and it's just like a small accent piece to all of this and we talked about it before like part of the conversation around the women's game you, you want to be too careful not to verge too far into this because for so long women were reduced just down to their appearance and it was the only thing that we talked about relative to this but I do feel like we're getting to a point now where hey the game's getting celebrated like there's legitimate interest in what it's going to look like with Camilla and Angel both there in Chicago as they've said anyone else good luck trying to get a rebound there Cameron Brink joining a good lineage of recent stars out of Stanford especially post players like Chanae and Neca now going to join the Los Angeles Sparks out there and continue that legacy on and on down the list like there's a bunch of legitimate interest what Caitlin Clark and the traveling show do now that she's basically going to be on national TV for every game when it comes to the upcoming season for the Fever who haven't made the postseason since 2016 uh, Tamika Catchings last year so there's so much legitimate interest in here that it does feel okay to take a nod and say hey it's really cool that these young people can all dress now 
Well, I think also, you know, it's a huge part of how people present themselves. It's a huge part of athletes' brands now. I think that the stylists um, are are basically crafting their public image in terms of how do you want to look? How do you want people to think of you? Um, and it, it's almost a disservice not to talk about it because the amount of work that goes into putting on what you are basically introducing yourself to the world as a professional now in. Um, and I just, I loved Caitlin Clark's outfit. I absolutely loved the the structure of the jacket. I thought Angel Reese, the, the, the hood, mm. I, I feel like, you know, and Cameron Brink was in Balenciaga. Like, I think that everybody, what was so fun, Camila Cardosa's red suit, everybody seemed to really match their personality with what they wore. It was very clear. Like if you follow college women's college basketball, which I have this year, last year, you know, I, I love this game. Watching these people come out in these, um, in these outfits was like, Oh, of course, like they nailed it in terms of who they are and, and, and what they want to present to the world. And I think that's not insignificant, Charlotte, because we've talked about personality as the sell. You buy into that, the storytelling of getting to know these players. And so the fact that you felt already, hey, I kind of know what these people are about is incredible as they continue to brand build at the next level. Because again, none of this goes away for these players. Like Cameron Brink, who was in one of the, um, I, I'm forgetting what shoe company she's with, same one as Kawhi Leonard, uh, New Balance. She was in New the Balance. New Balance ad yeah. recently. New, uh, she was in the New Balance ad on TV. That's not going to end. Caitlin Clark's getting ready to sign reportedly a million dollar a year Nike deal. Like all of this keeps rolling now as we keep presenting this and keep platforming it in a different way here. I will give you though a few moments of the highlights from last night that I think were outside of the norm there. One, shout out to Holly Rowe fighting for her life in that interview with Cameron Brink. <laughs> just off screen and next to the 6'4 Cameron Brink staring down, towering over our sweet Holly Rowe. Paige Beckers there supporting Aaliyah Edwards like a great dance mom filming in the yes. audience there just delighted with herself. But then I I think one of the coolest moments of the night, Kate Martin, the Iowa teammate of Caitlin Clark, who was there supporting Caitlin as the number one overall pick, wasn't invited to the draft, which usually is a sign you're not going to get drafted into a league where it's comparatively smaller just because there's fewer teams, who all of a sudden in the midst of this gets told, hey, move your seat towards the aisle, hey, put your phone away, and ends up getting drafted ultimately by the Aces, was just a cool moment on top of everything else. So very fun night with the W, very fun morning with Charlotte Wilder. Check her out on Oddball with Amin El and every day but Monday. Charlotte, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Always a pleasure.
All right, it's been quite a morning around here already. We've still got plenty of stuff to get into. Uh, big payday for one of the Eagles wideouts that might be causing a little bit of friction elsewhere. Uh, the ultimate about face potential heel turn brewing in the world of golf, which would, I mean, my brother in Christ, if Rory McIlroy to live has any sort of truth to the rumors here, this is going to be a weird week. But before we get to any of that, Dad is back. And a little peek behind the curtain here, the first hour of the show, we lost Dad almost immediately into it. And thank you to our friend Charlotte Wilder for being here to help us out and you know shepherd us through those trying times. But in the meantime, my dad has been fighting a war. We do senior versus the internet as a bit on this show. That has manifested itself into real life of my father versus the machines. He is a broken and defeated man who finally returns back to the casita now. Dad, how you doing over there, bud? I, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. I mean, I, I, I really don't. Um, I, I, I don't know why it's so difficult. I don't know why the internet is so difficult. I, I, I don't. All I know is my internet is with Cox and also the guys that set up my TVs out here. They're all coming over today between 1 and 3 o'clock. And let me just say, they will not be leaving. This could be a kidnapping situation. Ah! They will not leave the house until my internet is secure and running. So um, if I'm not on the show tomorrow, it's because I'm in jail, because I wouldn't let any of these guys go home, because that's what's going to happen today. I mean, I humped it over to the hotel next door. I was all set up there, and then my wife texted me and said, the internet's back, and I said, of course it is. Because that's how it works. After you go run somewhere, everything is fixed so you can run back. So, yeah, I've gotten an early morning workout. I'm ticked off because I don't understand all this crap. And I'm going to try not to take it out on the people coming over today, but they aren't leaving the house. So I hope they pack a lunch. I'll even feed them. I was going to say, you're going to try not to take it out, but you will kidnap them. So, okay, got it. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm not going to be... I'm not going to be... I, I won't be mean to them, Claudia. Okay. okay. I, I'm just going to say, you guys get comfortable. I have a very comfortable house. Okay. Get comfortable because you're staying. Ah. You, can, you can call your family, tell them you'll be home when said job is done. Got I mean, it. I'm not holding for any kind. The, only, the ransom is good frigging internet. Mm-hmm. That's the ransom. If I don't get that, they stay here. If I get that, they go home to their loved ones safe and unharmed. Good. Yeah, Good. this is a a, a, a a pattern with my dad. There are very few things that actually rock the boat with my dad. Like a simple man with simple needs. He loves a good bath. He needs his iPad so that he can watch all his shows. And all he asks, no matter which home he is in, is working cable television at places that he is paid yep. for. And that extends to the internet. And the only times I see my dad lose his cool are when he loses the remote and blames it on somebody else, or when he gets to a place that he hasn't been in a while that he pays a mortgage at, and all of a sudden the cable or internet's not working because, again, you're paying for it, so it should be working there now so he might get a little mean with them there he can be on um, dad on the phone with a person who works for a cable or internet company is a show that i hope everyone gets to see at some point in their life and i'm sure a lot of people out there have dads that are the same way where it starts off cordial but then after a while can turn incredibly competitive <laughs> Well, it, it turns bad because it takes you forever. You have to answer these questions before you can get to a human. Yeah. And so by the oh, time the you get to a human, it's, you're, you're in a ticked off mood. And, 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 and am I wrong, people? Am I wrong? Okay? My house out here, I pay monthly for TV, mm-hmm. internet, and cable. And when I used to come out here, when I had the other TV people, which I no longer use, I would come out here after months away and the TVs wouldn't work. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? When I go back to Notre Dame, to my house at Notre Dame, it works. Everything works. I walk into this house a while, you know, a couple of years ago and the TVs wouldn't work. What, do they get tired because they're not turned on? Do they have to be turned on every now and then so the power runs through them? I, I'm trying to figure it out. It's like space. It's like trying to, to define space. I can't do it. Like I can't do it. I don't know what's happening here. I don't, I don't know why. Why? Why? I pay my cable bill. I walk into this house. I hit the on switch, and the TV won't come on. 
Why the hell should that happen? I pay for my internet, and the internet won't go, won't go on. What the hell's going on? I, I feel I'm justified in all this. The worst part, too, is when you get on the phone, you get an actual person, and they say very calmly, I'm sorry you're experiencing that. Let's see what we can do. And it's like, I just waited uh, 25 minutes to get to you. Like, and you're you not going to you know, do you know, so you know, true. Uh, you, know, <clears throat> you know what else is worse? You go to the automated people, you give them all the information yeah. to finally get to a human. You get to a human, yeah. and then they say, I need some information. Yeah. I said, I just gave you guys information. <laughs> what the hell did you do with that? I oh, mean, it, I, I, you wonder why you get ticked off. Mm -hmm. Claudia is right, though. We need a series of operators that are trained to match the energy of the person calling. <laughs> hey, if I'm ticked off, I need you to be ticked <laughs> off with me. I need us both to be. Yeah. You should be allowed, <laughs> if you're one of the people dealing with customers, to cuss out your own company. <laughs> it's like, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, these people like, are trash. I don't even like working them. here. This stuff is junk. <laughs> screw it. You know what? We're going to get back at them for you. I need you to be on my side for a little bit yeah. when you're sitting in the customer service chair. And I think a lot of these companies would be better for that. So, again, we got ideas around here. They're proprietary. So if you steal these, Cox or any of these companies here, we will get litigious, but we are available mm -hmm. for a very, very hefty fee, which includes getting yep. my father working internet. So we're going to try and take advantage of the fact that dad right now seems to be with us for the time being here and have a little fun because another incredibly frustrating exercise that we all just went through collectively as a nation yesterday was tax stuff. Hell on earth. Going through this oh. entire incredibly insane and big amorphous process where we're not told how much that we owe and we got to figure it out with somebody whose job it is. It all feels like cottage industries made up to employ a bunch of CPAs and the people that run TurboTax. But that's a story for another day. We had tax day that came out and everyone, I my only wish for you is that you don't get audited. That's all I want for you. I don't want anyone to have to deal with that. But around here, we decided, Claudia, we wanted to take some time and audit a few takes that we saw out there in the world of sports, especially around the NFL. So we're going to go in and do the ugly job that I hope happens to no one else. Biggest scam of all time, taxes. I will give you that. But yes, we have some NFL headlines. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you guys a story, and you tell me if it's fraud or for real. So first up, we're going to start with Tom Brady, who keeps giving us some good sound from a podcast where he's sitting down getting a haircut. I don't know. you got to do interesting stuff, I guess, to stay relevant. He was asked who is the next quarterback to win his first Super Bowl. Who is it, Tommy? I like Josh Allen a lot. I think he's uh, – I'd say I'd pick Josh. Josh? Yeah. I like Josh a lot as a guy, as a leader. Um, but, you know, he's got to get past the Chiefs, and that's yeah. hard because Patrick's incredible in the way he leads that team. Yeah. Bills fifth in the odds right now at the DraftKings Sportsbook to win the Super Bowl at 12 to 1, tied with the Lions. So, go, Joe. Fraud or for real on this one? I'm going to go fraud on this one just because of the juncture. Like, I think Josh Allen can and will win a Super Bowl at some point. I think where their roster's at and where the Chiefs are at right now going to make it difficult to lift that lid at this point. And uh, it's interesting to consider how many quality quarterbacks we have in the league right now, Dad, that still haven't won that first Super Bowl. If you were going to ask me to offer one and say, eat this, not at that, in terms of Josh Allen winning a Super Bowl, if not him, then who? Like, playing the odds here, Brock Purdy probably is the name that comes to mind. This 49ers team, once again, looks like they're going to be the class of the NFC. And in that final year of his deal where, yeah, even when he gets paid, I think they're still going to be a really competitive outfit. I think he's got a really good shot just in this next coming year if San Francisco can finally get over the hump. I fraud this. And I, Mike, I would probably take Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Brock Purdy, Jalen Hurts, C.J. Stroud over the Bills, because this is more about the team. We're talking about the quarterback. I get it. But this is about the team. I, I, I think their, their window is closing a bit there. They got rid of a lot of the veterans. They're trying to reshuffle a little bit. Let's see how they come out. But I put a number of teams ahead of them, which means a number of quarterbacks ahead of Josh Allen to win the next Super Bowl. So that to me, this is absolutely fraud.
I think in the AFC, I'm with you. I would absolutely, like Lamar Jackson was the first name that popped into mind, but I think understanding, hey, the AFC is so difficult because Kansas City lives here and they're the dynasty right now. But I would probably put Lamar Jackson, for the reasons that you mentioned right now, overall, it seems like, well, Baltimore is going to deal with some losses of their own. I think the brain drain on that roster in terms of their coaching staff that just got a lot of big names plucked off of that, defensively, some of the guys they lost there as well, their offensive line is going to look entirely different. They're not without question and concern. But the level of football that Lamar Jackson played last year, him and Josh Allen were both stellar, but I think the Ravens organizationally have shown, hey, we've already had to change some stuff around Lamar Jackson. We've already made moves, and they've worked out bringing Todd Munkin in there, reorganizing some of the passing attacks. Zay Flowers, they're alongside that tight end room that had been great. And so I think if you're going to structure it even in the AFC, I would put Lamar before Josh Allen at this point in time. So we're both going fraud on that one, Claudia. What do we got to audit next? Breaking news. In parentheses, Niners wideout Brandon Ayuk requested a trade. This is according to an NFL insider on Twitter, on X, whatever you want to call it. But then his agent quote tweeted and said, you need to find better sources. This comes after Ayuk, who is entering the final season of his contract, did generate buzz on following the Niners on Instagram. Senior, I know you love to talk about social media. So with that in the fold, yeah. although his agent did sort of Put this down with the quote to eat fraud or for real on this one man i i i think i think this will end up being fraud i think this is just a leverage move by Ayuk when you start scrubbing your your social media you know of, of your team to show that hey i'm serious about this when this is what everybody does um, San Francisco is getting into an interesting situation with a lot of talented players, and now they're and then they're going to have to pay Brock Purdy at some point as well. We always talk about the rookie uh, wage, the rookie wage scale for the, those rookie quarterbacks. I should say when you're on that rookie contract, eventually you have to pay them. And Ayuk, Ayuk deserves the money. Does he deserve the money? Uh, the money Devontae Smith just got. I mean, the last two years, this guy's had over a thousand yards, over thirteen hundred yards. 15 touchdowns, averaging about in the last two years, 14, 15 yards a catch. I mean, it's just, there's just so much talent on that offensive side of the ball with Debo and Kittle and Christian McCaffrey that he's one of them. So at some point, you probably can't pay them all, which is a shame because you have an open window now. We just talked about San Francisco with the ability and the team to be able to win the Super Bowl. And that's not even getting to the defensive side of the ball. Of paying players, so I still think, Mike, this is uh, this is fraud. Um, I still think uh, they can end up paying him. You can still get away with it. You didn't have to pay Brock Purdy just yet, so I still think he'll be in San Francisco. I would probably agree, and I think the the sticking point because you mentioned the numbers with him and Devontae Smith. Pretty similar over the last couple of years. Like Brandon Ayuk, 14, uh, 15 touchdowns over the last two years. Devontae Smith, 14 touchdowns over the last two years. Both with over 1,000 yards each of the last two seasons. Both up over 70 catches. A little bit more volume for Devonta Smith. So in an offense that gets you so many yards after the catch, Ayuk been able to do a little bit more on a yards per catch basis. But I think very similar profiles for this team. And Devonta Smith's contract made him the fourth highest paid wide receiver in the NFL. So it didn't reset the market market there much the same way I don't think right. Brandon Ayuk is by any means a reset the market kind of player no. he might get a little bit more because he's next but I think he's right in that wheelhouse in terms of these two as players where if you made me pick one I'd probably give slight edge to Brandon Ayuk big physical affords you a lot and has come a long way as a blocker in that offense that asks a lot of it in the Shanahan McVay schemes but I don't think it's by any means a leaps and bounds better than situation yeah one thing I like about both of them they've both been pretty durable as far as games they've played, right? Mm -hmm. Playing all the games or maybe missing just one. And that was that was a question about Devonta Smith coming into the league because he was very slight. Would, would he be able to handle the rigors of getting knocked around? And he's done it very well. You know, he's he's been uh, been productive while being the, the most uh, uh, the best ability is availability, and he's been out there. So he got paid, and and I think Ayuk will get paid. Absolutely. All right. So we're both uh, we're both in on that one, Claudia. What do we got up next? 
This one, I'm just going to let you know, I'm saying it's for real because I agree with Joe Burrow who says, let there be taunting. He said this on Jason Travis Kelsey's New Heights podcast. He said, quote, yeah, I'm pro taunting. We're all grown adults that work really hard at what we do. And sometimes we'd like to show it. I'm not going to get my feelings hurt if somebody sacks me and taunts me like, yeah, you made a play. I get it. Good for you. Like I said, I am the fan, so I totally agree with this. You guys actually played the game, though. Senior, is this fraud or for real? Do you agree? I, 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 I think for Burrow, it's for real. And I, I don't have a problem with it at all. They, they won't do it because of how it looks to the younger kids. That, that's why they're not going to do it. You know, they feel the pro sports feel there's a responsibility to, the, you know, the kids coming up that will be the next generation of players or to even those that aren't and will maybe only play Little League football or, or up through high school. And they don't want to send that message because well, that's what kids do. They emulate the pros. They emulate the stars. And if you see a star finger wagon or st standing over a guy and, you know, posing and taunting, they're going to do it. You know, and to me, that's up to the coach. That's up to the coach and the parents to not have the kids do it. Uh, so I, I, I'm not, I don't fully believe in, man, don't do it if you're in the pros because then the kids will do it. Well, you know what? There are, there are kids out there that have people that oversee them that can make sure they don't do it and, and coach that into them or parent that into them that you're going to sit if you do something like that. There could be different rules in the pros and in Little League uh, up to high school. So I, 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 Joe Burrow's right, man. It's a lot of work to get where you are. It's a lot of work to be successful at that level. You know, these are grown men out there. You know, let them, let them finger wag a little bit. I, I don't care at all about that stuff. Yeah, you know what? It's it's so weird, like I how like my mind kind of starts to think about these differently a little bit now. Like I'm not again, I'm not old by any means, but sitting here in my mid 30s, watching my friends raise kids and seeing videos of kids that now very much do emulate what they see on these top levels here. Like you've seen videos of fifth grade basketball leagues where the kids are all in the shooting sleeves and giving everyone the too small here. And I don't know the kind of psychological effect that sort of stuff has on kids at that young age. If you've got kids getting bullied like that on court or not, because dead in general, when it comes to the grown folks I'm with you on this like you're going out there and especially in football you're writing a check that your ass has to cash like if you want to go out there and talk smack to somebody guess what they get a chance to legally assault you the next play so if you're comfortable in doing that by all means get after it and if you're good at it I was always jealous because I couldn't talk smack very well I was never very good at it yeah. it is somewhat of an art form so that much I will definitely say I am all in on there the one thing I do want to say too is the source of this Joe Burrow joined Travis and Jason at their New Heights podcast back at Cincinnati where they did the little baby games and it was this awesome thing i can't believe some of you idiots out there were getting up in arms because they did a mock they made fun of the fact that jason and travis kelsey never came to pick up their diplomas for graduation and people thought that travis kelsey was actually chugging a beer at graduation making a mockery of this sacred process are you more it's april Who's graduating in April, in early April right now, at a podcast taping? It's unbelievable, the dumb stuff. I feel like dad right now, where I'm triggered by something simple on the internet here, but good lord, the fact that Jason Kelsey had to come out and actually feel compelled to respond to this was insane. Don't you hate that you're starting to do things that I do? You mock me, and then all of a sudden just, you sound like me, and you're doing things that I did. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome to my world, Sonny. Welcome to my world. Midway through that rant, I just realized, oh my God, this is dad's rant. This is what he's supposed to do on here. And now yep. here I am having a real reckoning inside myself. You're not alone, Gojo. That was ridiculous. But people love to complain. That was, what do you that was stupid. Yeah. That was, it's ridiculous. Really but but that, that's what people do. And, and like I said, you go to that showboating thing and you're in a little league and some kids showboat, sit them down. You just tell them. Listen, any of you do it, guys, showboat at all, you're sitting the bench. You're sitting down. I mean, you're, you're allowed to do that. There can be differences in pros and little league. So, yeah, I, I, I don't. I'm, like you said, Mike, you know, you got to cash the check. So if you're writing it, you got to cash it. So at that level, go ahead. Doesn't care. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bug me one bit. Yeah, it's it, like it, it, I've I've always been pro taunting. Like I, I really have been. I think it's another one of those areas where the personality gets to come out, and it's an incredibly intense sport. We talk all the time. People excuse away quotes after the game or actions by saying, "Well, what do you expect? You play out this gladiator sport, and then you're supposed to go have a normal conversation in the post game interview and stuff like that." 
I can actually draw more of a line in the sand on that because you're used to the ebbs and flow there. In the middle of a game that's hotly contested, if you want to get up and let somebody know, like when they do this in the NBA after guys get up over dunks and taunt somebody, who in their right mind that is physically capable of dunking wouldn't want to stare down the person they just put on a poster right after that? It's un-American, and we shouldn't be asking people to do that. After Scotty Scheffler got his green jacket, he went to a bar. That's another part of the story, which we'll get to. But the more important part here is that Liv took over the headlines. Because Rory McIlroy, who has been against Liv, is now in rumors to possibly join them. This is according to City AM, which is an English outlet focused on business and finance. According to the report, two separate sources informed the paper that a deal is close. So this could be coming soon. An estimated $850 million. He would also receive a 2% investment stake, and they got a lot of money, so that's a lot of money in the company. Senior, this is shocking to me. What would this mean for McElroy and the PGA Tour? I don't know what to believe in this one, Mike, because why, why I'm trying to think they're supposedly going after Victor Hovland as well. Why would they still be trying to sign players when there's going to be an agreement between the two factions. That's what I didn't understand. And, and for Rory, listen, the, the optics are horrible for him because of how vehemently he was against players that went to live until there was that moment when they decided, hey, PGA and Liv are going to, are going to somehow combine, and everything kind of softened at that point. But this... Boy, this would be the ultimate. I mean, I, this would be un. So I, I think, Mike, there were a bunch of PGA players. Once they they talked about there being agreement, a bunch of PGA players were like, well, "Wait a minute, <laughs> that nothing's going to happen to these guys that went to live and they got all this money." So 
okay, maybe we'll just take the money. You know, if, if, if nobody has any hard feelings anymore, if the two, two factions are going to get together and they're still offering money out there, I'll just take the money. $850 million. I mean, that's, that's tough to turn down given where, the, given where the stance is now on both sides where they're basically trying to work together. That would be stunning, but horrible optics for him, right? Well, I mean, we've seen him be a lot softer on Liv in recent months yeah. in the way that he's talked about it, right? Where he said, uh, I think the la most recent one was, I think what Liv has done is it's exposed the flaws in the system of what golf has. We're all supposed to be independent contractors and we can pick and choose what tournaments we want to play. But I think what Liv and the Saudis have exposed is that if you're asking for millions of dollars to sponsor these events and you're not able to guarantee to those sponsors the players are going to show up, then you've got an issue. So basically... Uh, he got beaten down over time, Dad, and I think you couple that with the fact yeah. that, hey, if he's not going to be out here winning majors at the clip that he was in the early aughts, then all of a sudden it becomes kind of what I think Push Brooks Kepka out, which is, all right, I might as well at least get paid if I'm going to deal with all this pressure right now and if everybody else is doing it. And, Dad, to your original question, the fact that they're still signing, even though we thought that this was supposed to be a partnership that was going to bridge, it seems like that's been taking quite a while. I know Tiger got asked about the conversations yeah. that they've been having with them at the Masters as well, but I'm sure they're all looking around and going, all right, this was supposed to be done. There means every passing day that we get further from that, that becomes a more difficult road to tow. And so in the meantime... There's money out there, and they're like, all right, if this is going to be the way of the world, then I'm at least going to be rich for my wares and all this. And Rory would be like, I'm not going to lie, Dad. When we got done with the Masters, the first thing I thought was, how soon will they come for blank? How soon will they try and come again for a guy like Scotty Schefter? It sounds like Victor Hovland's going to be yeah. the one there. But after every major tournament, I'm just assuming that Liv is going to keep trying to undercut the PGA in the midst of this negotiation by saying, oh, you, you like the product that you saw this weekend. It would be a real shame if no one saw it until the next major because we just kept offering these people more money than God. And... and I know from what we understand in the supposed deal, the PGA side of it, because the PGA players were now, well, wait a minute. Now we're going to merge with Liv. The Liv guys who left got all this money. We got nothing. As Rory said, we were sacrificial lambs, or he felt like a sacrificial lamb. And they were trying, fit, trying to figure out ways to pay, get some extra money to the PGA guys to make up for it a little bit. But I don't know where any of that is. And I, I'm trying to figure out the game plan of Liv by continuing to sign these players. I mean, nobody watches it, right? Are, are they thinking that somebody's going to watch it now? Uh, no, I, I, no, I, I don't know. I absolutely know. do not I, think I, that. No, I don't, Dad, I, I don't I either. I think their game plan is weaken, weaken your enemy. They've got an unlimited supply of money from the black gold in the ground over there, and so they're looking at this and saying, hey, you know what the easiest way to get what we want is? Which is power. They don't want eyes. They want power. They want control over large sports bodies that they don't actually have to be the face of because then that gives them sway in the way that they're perceived as a country and as a ruling body over there by sports washing their reputation. It's the conversation we've had since day one here, but the way they get what what they want now with the PGA is by weakening their enemy. They can't go out here and make live stronger because you're right. No one's going to watch, but what they can do is right. use their limitless supply of money to just weaken the PGA product that we already heard golfers talking about, right? They're all worried about people not watching. They're all worried about fans not caring outside of some of these big major events where we get to see everybody again. And if that consternation is building there, it's got to be grounded in something. And so I'm sure the people in charge of live and the PIF want to keep feeding that by just picking off these guys one after another so are, are they trying to get more leverage in this deal with the pga by saying hey we have all your big stars you know and and if we're trying to merge it back together i i i'm trying to figure it out i mean i i, I it just looks bad because of how bet much rory was against it but there's going to be a lot of people that are like, yeah, I don't blame you. $850 million, that's just, you just hit the lotto. Now these guys, Rory is not hurting for money, but so what? You know what? $850 million, you just, you just got, you know, all five or six numbers and the Powerball on that one. Exactly. So I, I think that's kind of it from the play. It's interesting to consider from the overall versus the player side of it, because in the midst of it for the players, you're right. It's, hey, while this is all getting sorted out in the meantime, now that we've destigmatized most of this, 
I'm just going to go ahead and take my payday. The guys like Phil Mickelson that came through the wall first on this were the ones that had to absorb all the bad PR, all the bad press. I mean, look, John Rahm after the Masters last year won the Masters, and it's why I was so interested last seed how this is going to go this year because John Rahm won the Masters last year and then immediately went and took the live money and we saw there was some public conversation about it, but it's a lot less severe than it used to be, Dad. So I think the penalty's gone away for that now. How how creepy must it have been? They said Greg Norman, who's, you know, what, the president of Live or whatever, whatever is is, you know, his title is there, was following Rory around the first round. How creepy did that have to be? Right? Rory, Rory was like, oh, I didn't see him. I have no idea. But supposedly, yeah, Greg was following Rory in his first round, you know, maybe whispering in his ear, hey, 850 mil, man, 850 mil. You're not winning this anyway, so come grab the money. <laughs> Walk, following him around like a shady college booster back in the day, just trying to deal out yeah, $100 yeah. handshakes to see. It's like, hey, like we really appreciate what you're doing for State U out there, son. Just keep it up. Go, Joe. Can you guys hear me now? I can now, oh, yeah. We lost the guys. We lost the guys. I do want to get to this, though, because I mentioned it off the top. So Scotty Scheffler was getting a lot of heat because, of course, after the press, after he got the green jacket, he basically said, you know, I want to answer your questions, but I also have to get home to my pregnant wife. And then we got these pictures online. A man of the people, PGA Tour, anything, tweeted, no, like, you guys are all frozen. Scheffler, I, clock. I can hear Gojo now. Uh, Scheffler celebrated the hashtag Masters win at a local dive bar in Dallas. And the best part of this picture is the guy next to him, this long bearded man in the backwards cap, is looking at the green jacket like it's the best thing he's ever seen. Uh, so lots of drama surrounding this. I think Scheffler can get all the credit in the world. The man can do what he wants. If the baby has not been born yet, then let the man do what he wants to do. Of course, we'll keep you updated on all the Rory and Liv and PGA drama. The guys are gone. The internet is winning today. The humans remain undefeated. The world takeover is coming. We'll be right back. Stay tuned.
everyone. While it's become this awesome barnstorming event for the league and it's become an event that they can point to and sell to every year, for some of these guys, I'm sure they wouldn't want to be bothered with it. This seems particularly offensive line for a position whose lineage includes Joe Thomas going fishing on draft day before he was taken in the top three. So I can understand that. Yeah, I can definitely understand that. I mean, you had players that have skipped in the past famously, like we talk about Joe Thomas, who was fishing with his uh, – when fishing, he was the number three pick overall. Um, others have skipped it to be with their families. Joe Alt, uh, that, that doesn't surprise me with any of the guys in this, and they're all going to be first-rounders, Brock Bowers and McCarthy and Alt. So we talked about this the other day. Would you go to New York? Would you be one of those guys? It's got to be a pretty heady thing to be invited especially if you know you're going to be one of the top picks uh, to go there and kind of live that moment and bring your family with you. I think it would be a pretty cool thing. But I agree with you. I think Darius Robinson's the only one that you know, may have an, an interesting day ahead of him on where he's going to go. Um, but I, I listen, it's, it's a player's choice. They want to hang out at home. I'm sure I, I'll be, I would imagine they would let cameras into their house you know, if they're not going to be at the draft, hey, can, they, can a camera be at your house? You would think that's going to happen, uh, but we'll wait and see. Yeah, it's never really mattered to me. Like, it's cool when you get the moment. And some guys have talked about wanting to walk across the stage and see the commissioner, but I, right. I think for a lot of right. – Brock Bowers is the only – somewhat interesting one dad just because it's so weird in the last month I feel like we've watched what before was viewed as this unimpeachable prospect who was talked about in the same range as maybe a Marvin Harrison Jr. of a guy who was can't miss a guy coming out of college who was such a productive player that everyone's going to go head over heels when he gets to the NFL and now it's given way to all these conversations about well look at tight end positional value how much money you're saving on drafting a tight end of the first round versus just franchise tagging a veteran player later on and how even you use Brock Bowers, considering he's not the big, imposing physical standard you would normally see for a tight end that was going to do both, being a blocker and a pass catcher. So have you been surprised the way that he's been talked about? Because I know I have been a little bit. Yes. And go ahead and people go ahead and question him. I'll take him on my team any day, right? I mean, the, the normal position of tight end, that's changed over the years anyway. What you're looking at now is you're looking for mismatches, right? When we talk about a back, you know, uh, splitting out, whether it's in the slot or as a wide receiver, who's covering him. Same thing with Brock. He's not that big, huge tight end, but when he splits out or lines up like a wide receiver, who's covering him? You know, what kind of matchup do you have? You know, you, you, I mean, go ahead, put a linebacker on him. See how that works. You know, so who, who is going to cover him? So I, yes, I have heard it and I am surprised. I think this kid is going to be fantastic at the next level. Yeah, I, I think for me with Brock Bowers and myself in general with tight ends always, and I know Andy Reid's talked about this, is like, I don't need you to be a devastating blocker. It'd be sick if everyone nope. was George Kittle and loved it and was frothing at the mouth and was basically technically like an offensive lineman. That'd be awesome. But that's not the case. I need you to be good enough to justify the ways that we're going to use you elsewhere. And that's the sell with Brock Bowers is you can put the guy anywhere. Like, you can put him all over the field. He can do a variety of things and did in that Georgia offense for so long, and he can be effective. And that also means you can hide him as a blocker in those certain spots here. He's great on the perimeter blocking like a wide receiver. You can put him in that sniffer spot in the backfield, and he's going to go and be able to wall guys off because he cares about it and because he's technically proficient enough. He's just a little on the small side. But I, I do understand, yep. Dad, Like especially the way the draft board shakes out this year, I wouldn't take him in the top 10. I don't really think there's any team based on their needs that can afford to take him in the top 10 and feel good about it but as you get into the teens I absolutely think that's prime range for him once you get down to that area I wouldn't see him certainly getting below like a team like a Seattle at 16 if he were to fall down there you sprint towards the podium and hand in that card that's possible the Jets at 10 though right I mean that's that's been some of the mock drafts having him at the 10 slot I, I could see that because that is a tough position to on, on where it's going to go, where where you could be. As we said, he was one of the best prospects we thought, but wasn't going to be, you know, a top five pick. But I I could see him going to the Jets at 10. They're loading up on weapons. We know what they've brought in and we know what they're trying to do. Obviously with Aaron Monta, they helped the, they've already helped the old line uh in in the offseason. I think that would be a monster grab for them. 
It's just going to bet me whether or not I think they feel like they need to load up on O-line even more, what the wide receiver group looks like there as they continue to try and put weapons around Aaron Rodgers, all those things that I think could weigh into all of this. But I think that's probably where the conversation around him starts, though, is at that point, again, I can understand the financials of it saying it's better to take a risk on some other positions at that point. There was also, Dad, the story on ESPN.com by Elizabeth Merrill the other day that actually went into and looked. We talked so much at the top of the draft about the Eli Manning, John Elway, hey, use your leverage to dictate your position in the draft. After we heard Deion Sanders come out and say this about his son Shador and Travis Hunter, the star wide receiver cornerback on their team. We'd had the conversation around Caleb this year about why more teams don't do that. And I thought it was interesting as much as anything they pointed to modern NFL agent structures where you've got so many of these big box agencies that represent so many players and have so many relationships around the league that they're much less inclined to want to rock the boat with a prospect than maybe someone right. in years past, especially with the rookie wage scale where it's only going to financially net you so much early on here. Yeah, I, I agree that the rookie wage scale, I think, has possibly taken a lot out of this. We'll see. I mean, and I know he, um, Dion mentioned Shador and Travis Hunter and his and his son, who's the DB as well. Uh, the the, uh, the only one that has a shot to do anything like that is Shador, because Shador, the way he's going right now, it's going to be basically what him and Quinn Ewers and the kid, what Jackson Dart um, from Ole Miss, probably as the top prospects well, coming of the, in. Of the known names that we know before certain yeah. guys inevitably yeah. make their rise and yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a <clears throat> right. It's so, certainly a class with lesser star power in the names going into the season than this class was. And, and listen, if you want to try and and pull pull the leverage card, listen, go ahead. If it works for you, great. But you know, just know it may not. I, I know a lot of people are are. Don't like the Dion's brashness about it. You know, I know the teams. I'm talking to the teams. There's five teams that my guys are going to go to. A lot of people are turned off by that talk, but so what? Doesn't affect me. Doesn't affect you. If if he wants to try and swing that and 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 get his guys to warm weather teams that he was talking about, go ahead, give it a shot. But just know it may not work. You know, it it may not work, and you may just have to go where you're drafted. But I, I'm not going to blame somebody for trying. We've seen it work in the past. It's not it's not the prettiest thing in the world. I know most people are like, oh, you're getting drafted to play in the NFL. Just be happy with that and all that, well, which is fine, which is true for 99% of the people. But there are those that figure, you know what, I got enough leverage where I can try and get where I want to go. Well, and that's just the thing, though, is you have to be that good of a player. Like John Elway, legend, yes. like, legendary, generational prospect. Yes. Eli Manning, consensus number one overall pick. All these things that have to work in your favor that we don't yet know for Shador in here. I thought the best point Dion did make, though, and this is the difference of, hey, when it comes from the player side, you got a face for this. It's the player. It's Dion Sanders. As he pointed out, teams manipulate the draft all the time. All these leaked reports about players' wonderlick scores and all the different things about their meetings. Right. Where do you think that comes from? Teams trying to get this at a bargain. Teams trying to get guys to drop to where they're at in here. It is absolutely teams trying to manipulate this process in their favor. And because it's done anonymously and it's an anonymous source or GM or throughout this process, no one's actually got to answer for that in a meaningful way versus when it's the player trying to figure it out. You know right where to go with your complaints. And like Dad said, you can lob those greedy labels their way in a heartbeat.
All right, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, the third, three quick stories to send you into the rest of the day. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five-star rating, and try and check us out live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. If you can't do that, you can catch the best of Gojo and Golik from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear v on the radio. And if you can't catch that or any of our great guests, thanks to Charlotte Wilder from Oddball for joining us for hour number one of the show. You can hear that wherever you get your podcast or available right here on YouTube after we get done. Guys, let's talk about this. We talked about the Eagles a bunch today um, with Devonta Smith getting the nice contract there. Jordan Mailata also got paid this offseason and appeared to want to celebrate in his own special way by using the golden voice that the 6'8 monster man happens to have. We've heard him sing on the Eagles offensive line Christmas album that him and Jason Kelsey and the rest of the dudes put out. But Jordan Mailata went to Newtown's Green Parrot Bar and joined the band Emo or Code Emo on stage to cover Valerie by Amy Winehouse. And do we have a clip of this? It's incredible. So good. One time for Jordan Mailata wow. continuing to have a golden voice, an absolutely illustrious set of pipes for a man that's also that good from mo- at moving people from point A to point B against their will. But also just shout out to Valerie for being a bop. Probably doesn't get talked about nearly enough for being an absolute banger. So good. I have always said that athletes want to be entertainers. Entertainers want to be athletes. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to sing some in certain situations, and I enjoy doing it. Um, I have, a, I think I have a, I think I have a voice that won't make people run for the hills. It's just decent enough to not make people leave. This dude's at another level. I mean, he's, he's unbelievable. He could be in that business. He could leave football and go in that business. I mean, it is, it is incredible. I love seeing those hidden talents, which hasn't been hidden so much anymore with him because A, he's 6'8", and B, they've put out a couple of Christmas albums. But that is so cool to watch and see him enjoy that so much. Senior, you can't just slip that through here. Do you have a voice, Gojo? Is he hiding something? So, well, no, what he's trying to play coy about is, uh, so Darius Rucker is someone that dad got to know and we've gotten to know pretty well for a while here is an awesome friend. And at one point he's also a big South Carolina fan. And years ago, dad and Darius made a bet on the South Carolina and Notre Dame women's hoops game at the time where if South Carolina had won, Darius would have gotten to come in and host all four hours of Mike and Mike one day and talk about whatever he wants, program it the way he wants. And when Notre Dame eventually won, dad won a chance to go sing whatever song he wanted on stage at Darius's concert, I believe in Indianapolis and in Indiana and he sang take it easy by the Eagles out on the stage and actually did really well like he went out further past the speakers than he was supposed to and a whole band was worried about him dad they're asking you what key you wanted to sing in. you had no freaking idea that was so much fun it was wild because yeah Darius said you can sing any song you want but none of mine he didn't want me to sing any of his songs I'm like well that hurts (laughs) so yeah I did take videos I did take it easy of this and yeah, it's on YouTube somewhere. And then okay. in in backstage before the concert, I'm trying to find that happy place of drinking, of not getting too drunk, <laughs> but being, you know, just lightly buzzed enough to not not worry about embarrassing myself. When one of the guys in the band, John Mason, who plays the bass, comes over and said, Are you singing this in G? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Singing like- this in G. I said, I hear the song on the radio. I'm singing it just like that. That's what I'm doing. And that's what I did. And they did. They told me where you stand, don't walk past the speakers because you'll get a little bit of reverb. So, of course, I got into it. I started thinking I was the coolest, you know, thing in the world. And I walked all the way out there and just was singing my ass off. It was so much fun. I'm not going to lie. I had a ball doing that. Darius, by the way, did have to sing the Notre Dame fight song up there, which was which we enjoyed that as well. That is so cool, There we man. go. In, well. Yeah. A bet where everyone won there. Uh, speaking of someone's ass flying off, Claudia, let's get to that. <laughs> Someone pooped their pants at the marathon <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> the transitions are golden. Uh, yes, Davis Clark is a Boston TikToker. 
He apparently he works in the financial district and he's always posting TikToks about locking in, being great, all that. Well, he posted a video yesterday of him running the Boston Marathon. He does a quick pan down. Uh, I think we have a video. I don't know if you want to see it, but I gave it out to you, everything I have for the people. 256. I sh pans like crazy. I'm going after it all day, every day for the people. Two hours, 56 minutes, man, people. He did it for the people, okay? And if you can't see the video, there is poop down his legs. But it's just the mindset to be like, he said, I, mm, my pants like crazy, but I did it for the people. <laughs> I, I, does he have, I, I don't know him. Does he have people? Is he a oh, famous TikToker? Does he have him. these people? Yes, people love they do. him okay, on TikTok. I, yeah. So I, I also wonder now, as I said, your mother ran one marathon in her life, and this did not happen to her. She she ran it incredibly well. I, w I wonder how much this does happen, though. I, I, I have no idea. You got 50,000 people running the New York Marathon, 30,000 running the Boston, 40,000 running the Chicago Marathon. I got to believe that happens yeah. more than we think. This dude just in this day and oh, age yeah. just wanted to tape it for everybody. Yeah. So I, I, that what a horrible feeling. Now, Mike, you and I both have experienced this, experienced this on the field uh, at times, more pee than, than poo, but, you know, still happens. Oh, listen, I've peed my pants on the field, and I've pooped my pants as an adult. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Like, you know, things happen sometimes. Oh, yeah. But this is like this is like my my niece, like Alex, Sydney's daughter. It, it's unbelievable <laughs> watching her just blow out her onesies here, the chocolate shotgun yeah. situation that's going on with her and yeah. with this guy. I mean, this is... An insane amount of poop to have running down your legs in any social situation, yeah. but then to have to be active through that. That's the, the thing with marathons so, with me, not to you know, change the subject too much. This, the nipple bleeding that goes on, what part of this seems yeah, worth it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how I, are you guys I agree just with that. going and past these? You guys both had poop games? Like, I need to hear about that. But okay, senior, go I, ahead. I, no, I didn't I, have a poop game. I didn't it's have pee a, games. I pooped I didn't my have pants a, as an adult. Yeah, like, I didn't just, have you know, not trusting a fart. Yeah, I pooped my pants as an adult. You know, it's one of those where you have to go to the bathroom and you have to go try and get to the bathroom slowly because if you start to run, your butt <laughs> knows that. And it says, no, 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 we're not going to let you make it. But as far as peeing your pants, what we used to do is you take a towel on the sideline and you stuff it down your pants and you pee into the towel. That way you don't get it on your pants. Mike obviously didn't follow those lines because Mike peed his pants. You could see the pee mark on his pants. <laughs> yeah, if you guys want to go Google Mike Golick Jr. Senior Day photo, you um, can do that on your own time here. Yeah. Instead, we're going to get to the third yeah. and another setting where people might pee their pants. Claudia, the Ole Miss Spring Game remixed things a little bit this year. Uh, yes, they did. Tradition out the window. They brought in seven-on-seven seven drills, a dunk contest, an obstacle course, hot dog eating contest. Joey Chestnut made an appearance. It was a series that Lane Kiffin dubbed Grove Bowl Games, centered around, of course, fan entertainment because there's really anything, yeah, dunk contest, anything but football. I don't know. This is very strange to me, senior. It's the opposite of old school. Well, Do you like this? Do you not like this? Yeah. Well, they, they had a number of injuries in the spring. And, you know, at, at some point you're like, I, I, we're not going to put our guys in a position to get hurt anymore or you just don't have enough. So I think this is great. You know, the, the spring game, I mean, you're getting all the spring practices. So it, it's kind of like – it's kind of like the Senior Bowl. The practices are more important than the Senior Bowl game itself, the, pra the Senior Bowl practices. And I think that about spring football. The practices are more important than the actual spring game itself. So I think this is cool. Do I think it'll catch on? No, because this is Lane Kiffin. And, you know, I, I expect things like that out of Lane Kiffin, but it's not going to become the norm. Like I said, it was kind of in lockstep where they had a decent amount of injuries and just were looking to not put the pads on. Yep, it's uh, very Lane Kiffin, but we appreciate the effort from everybody involved. Fun to see Joey Chestnut out there. Not surprised at all that it happened. Uh, good on them there. Good on everyone that stuck with us through this show. Uh, if you appreciate it, somehow sure. download, subscribe, rate, review. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out here Monday through Friday live from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow.